Well, we're, we're continuing in this series, uh, started a few weeks ago, called Boundaries. And uh, so far in this series, what we've done is we've taken the idea of, of uh, metaphorically, but something that we're very familiar with, the idea of cautions. All the different cautions that we are familiar with and deal with every single day, like caution barrels that are in the road, or maybe the orange caution cones, maybe even some caution tape, you know, that we have saying, don't go past here, flashing lights, caution lights, etc. And what we're doing is we're taking that concept and applying it to some of the most important areas of our life. And so the question you might ask is, well, why would you do that? Well, there's a simple reason. That is because a boundary or a caution is there for only one reason, one reason only, and that is to keep us safe. It's to keep us, it's to let us know, it's to warn us, to keep us out of the danger zone so that not only do we not hurt ourselves, but we don't hurt anybody else either. And that's where we find ourselves every day. We find ourselves dealing with that kind of thing every single day. So we're talking about placing certain boundaries in our lives in order to keep a safe distance back from going into an unsafe place. And when we get too close to those boundaries, even if we bump up against them, say we might bump into an orange barrel that's made out of plastic, we might do a little damage, but the little damage will keep us from having a whole lot of damage. And, and that's kind of the idea. So with that in mind, we've looked at different aspects and we're going to continue over the next couple of weeks to look at them. Next week we're going to look at, at, at how this applies to our, finance, our finances with financial boundaries. It's going to be a good one. We're, we're talking about moral boundaries, friendship boundaries, relationship boundaries, boundaries that we have in our workplace, wherever that may be. What, what if in all those areas and even more that we had some boundaries that kept us back from the edge uh, of disaster? See, I really believe this is what God had in mind when he gave us his incredible word. We call it the Bible. He gave us this incredible word to use as a standard for the behavior of our lives, not to restrict us, not to hold us back, not to keep us from having fun, but on the opposite, just to keep us in, in a place where we can have the best life possible, which is what a lot of people don't under, understand. And like any good father, he wanted to be proactive in protecting us from harm, and so he gave us all this great information all this warning, all this caution, and if we will learn these principles and we will renew our mind as the scripture teaches in such a way with those principles, those mental caution lights and flashes will help slow us down and simply say, you know what, I'm going into a danger area here. I need to be careful here. I'm getting too close to something that if I cross this boundary, it's not gonna end well for me and for everybody that I love. And so I need to kind of back off and make some adjustments. So that's what we're talking about. And here's what we said last week. I reminded you that we live in a society and we live in, in, in a world that has the tendency to bait us to do things that lead to disaster. Constantly baiting us, luring us, on, on and on and on. And then when we fall for the bait, that same society turns around and punishes us and says to us, what were you thinking? That, that's the world in, in which we live when we step over certain lines. And I gave you a couple of examples of that. For example, you can go to an establishment and you can drink yourself into oblivion as long as you have money, but you can't walk out of that establishment and get in your car and drive home. If you do, it's going to cost you. Or you get those opportunities in the mail or wherever. You deserve it, so why not buy it? Buy now, pay later. And boy, do we ever pay later, right? And society says, hey, you should have this, you should have that, this is what's good for you. It lures us, it baits us, and then we get in over our head, and then that same society comes along and says, you're irresponsible in paying your debts, and now your credit score goes down, and you can't qualify for buying a vehicle, or buying a home, or anything else for that matter. And we're like, wait, whoa, 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 hold on. I, I was just doing what you told me I was able to do, and they go, well, sorry, you lose. Society does this in every aspect of our life. So, so be, be warned. So the question that you and I have to deal with is what are we going to do? What's going to be our response to that? And the answer is we have to establish some boundaries for our own protection. This is very critical and key moving forward. Now, what I decided to do today is a little bit different, but I felt like it was necessary because of where I'm going in the next two weeks. 
In the middle of this series, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about why it is that we have the tendency to resist doing what we all know we should do when it comes up for setting comes up to setting boundaries in, in our life. Because here's the reason. There is a reason why we don't do this. And I want to talk about that. Even though every one of us in this room know that we should set up some personal boundaries, and we all know that they're important and protective, there's a reason why, why we don't do it. And a major part of it is, is that we think in the back of our mind somehow, some way, that these boundaries are going to keep us away from stuff that we really want to do and keep us from having a good time. And so we don't like boundaries. And the idea is, is that, hey, I only live once, why not indulge? Get the most out of it that you can. There's a lot of people that live their life <coughs> by this simple philosophy. They're not interested in being charitable or generous with any of their, their belongings. They just want to make money for themselves and buy more toys and have more experiences. Or they're not interested in being wise and prudent. They just want to have a good time. Their goal in life is their next good, good time either with, with him or with her or them or whoever it, it, it may be, and they don't care about being responsible. They just want to have fun while they're still young enough to do it. Sounds reasonable, I suppose. The, the point is, is that even though boundaries make sense to us, we see people who live by that philosophy who wreck their lives every single day and pay a very, very high price for it, right? Right? And yet we have this tendency to look at boundaries as being in the way of where we want to go and what we want to experience. That's the resistance to this teaching. That's, that's the pushback. And it's also why we have the tendency to come to a place like this, church service, and then we get up and we leave and we continue to do what we've always done with very little or no change in the way that we approach life and what we do and what we don't do. Now, if you've ever had those thoughts that I just talked about, especially over the last couple of weeks as I have spoken, I want to remind you of a couple of things that you already know, but then I'm going to tell you a brief Bible story. It's a pretty cool story, uh, one you probably have not heard in church maybe before. But if you decide after you listen to all this teaching that you're not going to set any personal boundaries, would because you would rather live your life on the edge for, for whatever reason, because maybe you only go around once, so you might as well have a good time. Here's what I want to say to you. Even if you eliminate the boundaries in your life and you say, I'm not going to have any boundaries in my life, the tension and the tug of war that's going to go on inside of you is not going to go away just because you take the boundaries out. You're always going to have that tension. For example, and I'm going to talk about money next week, boundaries that we ought to have in place with regard to our money. It'll be interesting to see how many people come back next week, but I encourage you to do it. It'll be good for you. I promise you, it's good for me. Um, but when I share that information about boundaries of protection for us f financially, and then you get up and you leave here and you go decide to buy something that you really can't afford to impress somebody that you don't even like, um, if, you, if, if you decide to eliminate those boundaries and not have them and say, Sammy and that's just a bunch of hogwash, whatever. It's still not going to eliminate the temptation for you to buy stuff that you can't afford. You're still going to have to deal with that tension. Whatever your temptation is today that you struggle with, that is what has the potential to blow up your life for every single one of us. That tension is never going to go away just because you erase or you try to eliminate whatever boundaries that God's word and principles has in store for us. So what a boundary does is something that's very important for all of us and something that we need. It reminds us of the consequences that none of us want to live life with. They remind you that, hey, if I cross this line, whatever it is, it could cost me everything. It could cost me my job, my marriage, my kids. It could cost my reputation. It could, it could cost me my integrity, my, every, everything that I've ever worked for. I, I'm I may never be able to own a firearm or carry a firearm ever again. And the list goes on and on and on. The point is, wherever it is that you struggle, when you see this boundary, if you have one, which is why it's important to have them, you can then put on the brakes of your life a little bit because if you don't, the closer you allow yourself to get to the danger zone, the more complicated and the more serious the consequences of those decisions are going to be. And it's going to be more difficult for you to be able to say no. 
So what I'm trying to say is that the refusing to have boundaries in your life doesn't solve anything. It just moves you closer to the edge of disaster and it makes recovery a whole lot longer. And everybody knows this if you've looked and had your eyes open at all. I want to tell you something about yourself and your human nature. You already know it. I just want to remind you of it today. Your appetites, your desires, are never fully and completely satisfied. I say that because I think there's a lot of people that say, well, I don't have any problem with that. You're never to that point, okay? You're, you're never to that point. Let, let, let me give you a couple examples of, of that, how I can prove that's true. None of you in here have ate a meal this week that was so delicious and so awesome that you said, that's it, that's a meal to end all meals I'm never eating again. I don't care how good it was, you're going to eat again, okay? You've never ate a dessert to say that's the dessert to end all desserts. None of you in here this week got a hug from somebody you love and said, well, that's it. That's the best hug I could ever get. I'm never going to hug anybody again. I'm not going to do that. And the reason is, is because there is no appetite that you have, no desire that you have that can be ever fully and completely satisfied. Actually, the opposite is kind of true. The more you feed an appetite, the more the appetite grows. Right? Now, if that's true, and it is, what does wisdom say to that? What does wisdom say to that? I, I had a guy tell me this a long time ago, and it was a good exercise for me, so I thought I'd share it with you this morning. I don't think I've ever shared that, this here at Leesburg. He said, here's what I would encourage you to do, Sammy. If you could, kind of try to step out of your own skin, look at your life and where it is and the decisions you made, and see what advice you would give to you if you could look at your life from an outside angle, what would you say to Sammy if you could step outside of Sammy and look at, at, at your own life? What, what, would, what advice would you give yourself, knowing yourself? Knowing yourself, what would you say, there's, this is an area where you need to set up some caution barrels. This, this is an area where you need to have a flashing light, where, where you can keep yourself back from and you know very well because you know you, Sammy, this danger zone because you're getting too close to what you are the most tempted with. What would you say to yourself? Well, it's with that thought, I want to jump into a brief Bible story. This is going to be quick, so stay with me. 600 years before Christ came on the scene, there was a king in the Old Testament by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know why that's his name. His mama didn't like him. That's all I can tell you. But Nebuchadnezzar, you could never spell it in the first grade, could you? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a king in an area geographically, which is modern day Iraq, if you want to know where that is on, on a map. And he kind of had that complex that a lot of kings and leaders do. He wanted to conquer the world. But he particularly wanted to conquer Israel, who was a fortified nation at that time, and in particular, he wanted to overtake the city of Jerusalem due to its popularity and the treasures that it possessed. Now, old Neb was a pretty smart guy, and what he would do is this, when he went in to occupy or to overthrow a major city, instead of destroying the city and putting everyone into slavery, he would tell his commanders to go in and take captive, particularly the royal family, those who lived in the royal palaces, where, wherever that was, because the people who were in the royal palace were not only the most educated, they were also the healthiest people because they had the best resources available to them as well. And he would say to them, I want you to go in and I want you to get the, the best and the brightest and I want you to bring them back to me in Babylon, okay? At Babylon, which is Iraq area. So he would bring them back and what he would do is he'd put them into a training program, a reconditioning program, a debriefing program, and over time he would try to brainwash them with his culture, the culture of Babylonia. And so the result would be, and it was, that his society would be full of the brightest and the best looking and the most healthy, uh, productive people that the world had to offer. This was his idea. So what I'm telling you is, is that Nazism wasn't something that was just dreamed up. It wasn't anything new. 
But this, this, this was his, his idea. So in 600 B.C., he sends his armies into Jerusalem, conquers it, goes into Solomon's temple, levels it, takes all the valuables, and then brings back the best and the brightest to Babylonia to, in order to be trained, to reconditioned. And the four people, four of the people that he brought back were some of the most famous people that we know in Scripture. They also included Daniel, the prophet Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? So these were the four of the guys that they, they, they bring back. He brings them back there. He strips them down mentally. He tries to remove their heritage and their belief system and make them think and act like Babylonians. That was the idea. That was a three-year process they tried to put them through. Daniel 1.5 reads like this. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service working in the palace for the king. So here's the deal. They're living in the palace. They're eating the king's food. They're going to school, free room and board. Then after three years, the best of the best would get to work and live with the king in the palace. This was about as good as it gets when you're a slave, right? So they were selling this notion, if you want to have a good life here, this is the best way to have a good life here. But Daniel, being a young man, as young as he was, was very smart. Very, very smart. Not just in knowledge, but, but in wisdom. He was smart enough to see through this scheme and realize really what was going on. Now here's the deal. In this demoralizing, stripping down mentally, they would try to do as much as they could on the outside to get the inside of the person to change. And so they would give them completely new way to dress. They shaved his head. They pierced his ear. They gave him a new name, trying, don't miss this, this is very relevant for us in 2023, trying to change his identity. But Daniel realized what they were doing. They were slowly trying to strip away everything that he had believed and put, put, the, put their faith in. And the idea is that if they did it long enough and hard enough and, and you know, over and over and over, that one day he would wake up a Babylonian thinking and acting and living just like one, one of them. Worshiping their false gods, adhering to their philosophy of life but by them being healthy and smart, be a benefit to their culture and their way of, of living. Now, before I go any further, I wanna remind you of this, that Daniel picked up on something that we tend to miss when it comes to how culture works. I've said it a thousand times from this platform, I can't say it enough. Familiarity breeds acceptance, be warned. Familiarity breeds acceptance, be warned. Being familiar with something doesn't make it right. Just because we're bombarded with it a lot doesn't make it okay. What it does is it weakens our resistance and we give up resisting. It doesn't make it better. The consequences are still the same. It just makes it easier to go there mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Because we've, we've shrugged our shoulders and said, okay, whatever. We don't balk against it, all right? And we know this is how the world works. We see this all the time. The practical examples. We, we know that if you cheat on anything once, it's always easier to cheat the second time. If you steal something once, it's always easier and you know, less conscionable to steal the second time, right? I mean, this is, the, this is the, if you go over your head in debt once and you get out of it or work your way out of it, it's easier to do it a second time. You say, well, I did it before, right? Drug use, all this stuff. It goes on and on. And there's so many lines that once you cross them, the consequences don't go away. What happens is the familiarity that you have with them has just bred acceptance in, in your life. Daniel had something going for him I wish all of us could have going more for us today. Daniel was an independent thinker. You know we don't have much independent thinking going on today. But he was an independent thinker. 
he got it and he realized what they were trying to do to him. So Daniel decided to do something that I hope and want and pray that all of us will be able to do moving forward in the days ahead in our culture as we see it beginning to unfold for the worse. Verse 8. Read it along with me. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. The key word here is determined. Underline it. Mark it. Remember it. He said, this is as far as I'm going to go and this is as close as I'm going to get to being any further like a Babylonian. I'm not going to be like that. I'm, I'm going to draw the line here. Now, there's a lot of opinions as I've read commentaries on this over the years as I've studied the scripture as to why Daniel resisted eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine. Some say, well, it was because it was all dedicated to idol worship and he didn't want to participate in that. Others say because he was Hebrew, Jewish, that it wasn't kosher and he, you know, it was part against, against the Mosaic law. And there's a lot of, we're not, but it doesn't really say, and we're not sure. And that's really not the point. The, the, the point is, is that he determined here something that I hope we can be more determined. And, and it was, they weren't going to push him any further. He was not going to allow them to take him beyond what he knew was a boundary for, for himself. Now, we, know, we have very fortunate to have the story of Daniel in front of us, and we can read it, and we have, and we know without getting into another sermon, the, the, the story ends well for Daniel. But here's what I want to remind you of. Daniel made up his mind before he knew how the story was going to end. He determined to do what he was going to do. See, saying no to the king would have been a sure death sentence. Refusing his food, refusing his nutrition, it's part of the training program. It was about the biggest insult that you could give the, the royal palace. But I want to tell you why he made that decision before he knew how it was going to turn out. He made that decision because he could predict the end of his own story, his personal story. If he didn't set this personal boundary, he knew that violating his conscience any further was not going to end well for him and his relationship with his God, the God. And so he determined, he determined himself to do what he needed to do. So he goes to the king's chief, at Ashpenaz is his name, and he said, I know you're not going to like it, but me and my friends, we don't want to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine. Verse 9. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Now those two words are important and here's why. As you evaluate your boundaries, what, you're, what, what you are and what you aren't going to do, who you're going to do it with, who you're not going to do it with, you may think about that situation. You may say, well, I don't want to miss out on that. Or I don't want to feel like I've been deprived of something. But here's the part we forget to factor in. But young Daniel got it, and I hope we can do. And it's the now God part in that verse. Now God had given and provided behind the scenes for Daniel and his friends what they didn't even realize was being provided for them. And the now God part is the part that God will use when you make boundaries to give you not only protection for your life, but also direction for your future. Now, I really want you to hear me on this. This sounds like such a minor event, choosing not to eat and drink something. And yet, it's set on course in this story, a path for Daniel and his friends that literally saved the nation. <laughs> Had huge impact. Because as you read the rest of this story, by him saying, this is a line I will not cross, God used this to direct not only their life, but the lives of tens of thousands of people. Had he not made this decision, this, the book of Daniel would not exist and we would not be having this conversation this morning. And the whole future of this nation would have been different had he made a decision to eat and drink and become a Babylonian. That's the point. Now, I got to tell you that I stand before you today and I share with you that the times that I have felt personally the clearest direction for my life moving forward 
has not been in the middle of a Bible study, even though Bible studies have provided the foundation for me to have that clarity. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But the times that I have been clearest is when I have said, because of my biblical foundation, knowing what God's principles are, and being able to look at my life and evaluate it, I've been able to say, you know what? In my career, I'm not going that direction. In my, in my finances, I'm not going that direction. In my marriage, I'm not going that way. The way I deal with people and my integrity, this is what I'm going to do as far as my lines of honesty and ethics are going to be. The clearest direction I've ever had is when I have drew some lines in the sand, so to speak, and not only has it protected me, it's also directed me. Because had I not done that, I would not be standing on this stage today. Now, Daniel may not have fully realized it at the time, but that's what hung in the balance of, of his decision. And here's what I know about every single one of you gathered in this room. You have no idea what's at stake with the next big, or big or minor decision that you're going to make with regard to boundaries for your life. You may think it may really not even matter. I'm here today to tell you that it could be huge. It could really change the course and direction of your life. The next big decision you make could be the most defining moment that you've ever had in your life. And you'll look back and not only say, wow, did God only not only protect me, but he also directed my life because I determined in my mind, just like Daniel, what I was and what I was not going to do. Even as silly as it sounds, I just said, it, it stops here. I'm not going to go any further in this particular area. Daniel didn't know it, but Ashpenaz was giving them favor because of God doing what he does behind the scenes to give him favor toward them. I want you to understand that God will do that for you as well and for me when we, when we say, that I'm going to have some boundaries in my life. He'll help work those things out. That's his promise. All things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So Ashpenaz says, well, well, listen, Daniel, here's the problem. If I change your all's diet and your health begins to fail, the king's going to hold me accountable because he's invested a lot of stock in you guys, okay? He, he wants you to be certain people in the kingdom, and, and if you're not healthy, he's going to hold me accountable for that. So Daniel then goes to the attendant, it's kind of like the security guard that's been put over him to kind of make sure they do everything they're supposed to do. And he goes with him, and because of God's favor, he goes to the attendant and he says, he said, just give me 10 days. He, tried, he cuts a deal with this guy. Just give me 10 days. Me and my boys, get, get, give us 10 days. Let us not eat the meat and drink the wine from the king's table for, for 10 days. And if our health deteriorates, we'll reevaluate it then. Okay. So these guys um, get 10 days. They bargain their way into 10 days. And 10 days, lo and behold, they come back and guess what? They are healthier and brighter and sharper than all the other people who have been eating the king's food. So here's how it all kind of winds up and then we'll draw a conclusion right here, okay? God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding Every, in every aspect of literature and wisdom, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. In other words, God honored their decision. And here's the conclusion, verse 19. When the king talked to them, no one impressed him as much in the whole group as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azara, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they entered the royal service. Now, this was a beginning. This was the beginning of a journey that would end not only making a big difference in their lives, as we've already said, but in the life of, of that nation. I mean, we're not even talking today about the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But it was big. We're not talking today about Daniel in the lion's den. It was a major turning point. All of that happened all the way back because of a simple decision that Daniel said when he said, you know what, this is as far as I'm going to go. 
Did you ever consider that maybe some of the miracles that you want to happen, some of the great things that you want to happen for your life are not going to happen in a big way until you make the simple decisions that you need to make every single day? Will you determine yourself to say, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. Enough's enough. Because I know where it's going to lead. So here's the challenge for all of us. We've got to make up our minds and we've got to do this. And I'm just here to tell you that if you remove boundaries, it's not going to make the temptations go away. It's just going to erase your ability to say no because you're not going to have any caution. Familiarity always breeds acceptance, and you know that. And with no boundaries, you're in danger of losing everything. So I just want to encourage you to make up your mind. And this is one you have permission to be a little stubborn on. It's a good thing. I'm telling you, the world and our society is not going to help you with this. You have to take personal responsibility for your life. And removing boundaries and rebelling against this idea and pushing back is not going to remove the temptation. It just moves you closer to the line of disaster of what you're tempted with. I want to close you with this verse of Scripture. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Temptation comes from our own desires. Not yours, not theirs, not God's, your own. And we're all different. Which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, things which are contrary to the will of God, which always lead to disaster. And here's how we know that. Because when it's allowed to grow, what's it do? It gives birth to death. You kill everything in your life. You separate yourself from everything that is true, pure, and everything that you love and everything that you want. That's what death means, separation. Friends, you have no idea what it is that God today wants to do in you and through you. And you have the potential of being a difference maker, no matter what your age, no matter what you do or what you've done. Who knows how God could use every single one of you. But you'll never know what God can do in your life down the road in the lion's den <laughs> until you determine in your mind you're going to make some boundaries. And God will use those boundaries not only to protect you in a moment, but to direct you for good throughout the course of your life. That's the food for thought I wanted you to ponder on this morning. And I'm going to pray, and we're going to have an invitation. And if you want to make a decision, I'll be down front. Or if you just want to come up and pray or have this moment to yourself to meditate, that's fine as, as well. But we're going to have, a, have some, a beautiful song that's going to be played and sung for you. And it's going to be an opportunity. If you want to join this body of believers, you can come up, and we can have a conversation about that. But maybe today's the day when you need to say, you know what? I'm, I'm making a boundary in my life. I'm going to do something. It's a simple thing, but it could have great impact down the road, okay? Father, we are grateful for our time together and this great truth and principle we've come to learn from the life of Daniel. Um, we probably all would have been much more benefited had we learned and, and uh, adhered to it at a much earlier stage of life. But we're here now, and we're grateful for that. And we now have the opportunity to maybe do a little bit of re-eval and, and say, you know what, um, today's going to be the day for me. And uh, I'm going to take seriously because we all know, we all know the truth that the world is, is not going to participate in protecting us and directing us in a healthy fashion. It, it, it's spiraling, spiraling the other way. We, we've got to get serious about this. We, we cannot become just more familiar with what's going on and then shrug our shoulders in acceptance and allow it to affect our lives in that way. It will never lead us to a good place. Never has. Never will. So God, I pray that you'll give us the conviction today to, to maybe make some simple stands that we need to make so that you can continue to protect us and direct us in the future. We love you. We thank you for bringing us together. And I pray for all my friends here that you'll give them the courage to do just that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.